Hey everyone, this is a last minute crash review for the AP Biology exam. In this video, I'm gonna share some general tips and pointers for FRQs, review some basic skills that might pop up in the FRQs, and go over some commonly questioned content that may appear on the AP Biology exam. And remember, this video is meant as a review. It's definitely not meant as introductory content. This is for a cram session if you're preparing for the AP Biology exam. And remember, AP Biology is a trademark registered by the College Board, which is not affiliated with and does not endorse this video. So I have lots of other AP Biology resources, especially some other FRQ tips. And I also have information on what is specifically on the 2020 AP Biology exam. And remember, it's a little bit different this year. So if you're taking the exam in 2020, be sure to watch that video so that you're totally prepared for how the exam format has changed for this year. Let's get into it. Remember to write and complete sentences. You have to write in paragraph form. That means no bullet points, no numbered list, but you don't have to write perfect essays. And there are no deductions for grammatical imperfections. You do not need to write introductory or closing paragraphs, and you don't get points for thesis statements or topic sentences. You do not need to ramble. Remember, points aren't deducted from your essay score if you have an incorrect statement. You just don't receive points for that unless you don't contradict yourself. So if you state something correctly, but then later st state the opposite, you won't earn a point. And remember, format your order so it goes along with the points that you're supposed to answer in the FRQ prompt. And if you have extra time, make sure you read the prompt again, keep writing, and look out for contradictions. Remember, you will see things you do not know on the exam. It is meant to be that way. Do not panic. Just make sure you apply knowledge you already have to these new concepts. All right, a couple other things. You do not have time to restate the question. You do not need to do that, so make sure you skip that part. The long FRQs are worth a little bit more. On the traditional exam, on the uh, exam for the 2020 version, you can look in the other videos for the exact percentage breakdown for the scoring. Remember to review experimental design. One of the questions is definitely going to be on experimental design. You don't need lengthy explanations or filler words like thus, and you definitely want to avoid our subjective vocabulary like love or words like prove or absolutes. And be sure to gut check your response. If it feels right, you're probably on the right track. All right, a couple of experimental design tips. Remember, your independent variable is the thing that is changed or tested or manipulated. Remember, if you are the experimenter, think I for independent. What am I changing in the experiment? Your dependent variable is what is measured. Think about D for data. D for dependent. Where are you getting your data from? What are you measuring in your experiment? You probably won't have to make a graph if you are taking the 2020 version of the AP Biology exam, but you may need to interpret a graph or state which type of graph would be best to represent a particular set of data in an experiment. So remember, line graphs are best for measuring, measuring a change in something over time. Bar graphs are good for comparing individual categories with one another, and pie graphs are good for showing percentages or components of a whole that add up to 100%. If you take a look at some of the long FRQ questions of past years, a lot of them required you to either construct or interpret graphs. You can almost guarantee there will be some sort of graphing question, even if you're not designing that graph on your own. So in 2019, for example, in question two, you had to construct a graph, 2018, you had to construct a graph, and so on and so on. You can pause this uh, video and read through some of the other more specifics if you want to look in some of the topics that have appeared on prior exams. Um, but note that a lot of this is going to be knowledge application and then applying skills, not just regurgitating information. So make sure you focus on those skills when you are studying. You might have to describe trends and patterns in the data. You should say things like increased or decreased or remained constant, but you shouldn't say things like went up, went down, or stayed flat. And you wanna make sure you're specific as possible when you're describing the trend or the pattern that you observed. This graph right here has error bars on it, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Sometimes if you are asked to calculate something, you will be asked to round. Now you wanna make sure you know your place values. So if it asks you to round to the hundredths place, make sure you only round two numbers after the decimal point and make sure you don't confuse this because points will be taken off or you won't get points for a question if you do not have the correct rounding. All right, error bars, let's talk about them. If you are looking at a graph that has error bars and this graph does have error bars, imagine there are invisible bars here that you can't see and that dot in the middle is the point at which the bar would stop, but this would be a perfectly acceptable graph that you could draw with error bars. But if you're looking at error bars, you wanna determine if there's overlap between the bars of two or more sample means. If the bars are not overlapping, then there is a statistically significant difference between the values, which means our experimenters can consider that the measured values are not the same. And if the error bars do overlap, there is no statistical significance between the values. So for example, these two values here have overlaps, and so these two particular values couldn't 
be considered as different. There's no measure difference in those two values. All right, let's talk about other calculations that you might see. Mean, remember, you don't have to use this funky equation. This is just a complicated way of saying add up all the values and divide the sum by the total number of values. Now it is possible you may have to calculate things like standard deviation or standard error of the mean, though those haven't shown up on AP exams in recent years. Chi-square, however, is something that you may have to calculate, so let's talk about what chi-square is. This is a test to determine whether results of an experiment are significantly different from an expected value. And you're going to need to create a null hypothesis to go along with your chi-square calculation. So a null hypothesis is a hypothesis that assumes the results or outcomes are going to be due to chance or that there is no change in your experiment. And you also need to calculate degrees of freedom when you're using chi-square. Degrees of freedom are just a number of possible outcomes or your categories in your experiment minus one. So if you're working with four different categories, you subtract one, your degrees of freedom would be three. Now, if once you calculate your chi-square value, if your value is greater than the critical value, which is whatever shows up in this chart based on your degrees of freedom for um, our p-value of 0 0.05, then the null hypothesis is rejected, meaning our results are not due to chance. They are significantly different. So let's walk through what this looks like. When we're writing a null hypothesis, again, you're thinking about something that has no change, predicting that the results are going to be due to chance. So some examples could be taking a vitamin B supplement will have no effect on fingernail growth or tomato plants do not exhibit a higher rate of growth when planted in compost rather than soil or dogs fed whatever brand of dog food exhibit no significant weight gain in comparison to dogs fed their usual brand of food. In genetics, your null hypothesis was going to be the data are consistent with the predicted method of inheritance. So that means you're going to get the outcomes that you predicted from whatever method of inheritance that you're looking at. If we look at a potential problem with chi-square analysis on an AP Biology FRQ, you might want to look at the FRQ from 2013, question number one. This one had to do with flies in a choice chamber. You can pause this and look, take a look at the potential answers right there, but we're going to talk about chi-square for right now. All right. So in the next part of the problem, you're asked to explain whether or not your hypothesis would be supported by the chi-square test and justify your explanation. So here's the data that is given to us from the experiment. In our null hypothesis, remember, the flies will be evenly distributed across the three different parts of the choice chamber. We're not going to see any difference. So we know that we have three conditions, our side of the chamber with the ripe banana, the middle of the chamber, and the side of the chamber with the unripe banana. So if we make this table on our own, we can easily calculate the different parts of the chi-square formula and keep our, all our results together. So I like to start with the expected first. If we look at our data and we total up the number of flies we have here, this totals up to 60. So if there is really no effect on each of the parts of the choice chamber, we would expect that the side of the chamber with the ripe banana, the middle, and the end with the unripe banana would each have the same amount of flies. So we would divide this up evenly. 60 would put 20 on the ripe banana side, 20 expected in the middle, and then 20 expected on the unripe banana side. Now our observed values are a little bit different. So we look at the end of the experiment and we see the end with the unripe banana had 45 at 10 minutes, had three flies in the middle at the end of the experiment, and 12 flies towards the side with the unripe banana at the end of the experiment. Now this should also total up to 60. So what we're going to do now is plug in our values. So this symbol here means we would take the observed number, which is 45, subtract the expected, 20, square that value, and then divide it by the expected, so divide it by 20. And the value we would get from that is 31.25. We would do that again for the middle condition and then the unripe condition. And then we would add all this up because it's asking us to sum that, and that is our chi-square value. So if you add all these values up, you get 48.9. And then what we can do is look at our degrees of freedom, which is 2, because we had three conditions, 1, 2, 3, minus 1 is going to be 2, so our degrees of freedom is 2. And then we look at our p-value value for 0 0.05, which is typically what we use in biology, and when we see our critical value here is 5.99. Now we're going to compare that to the 48.9 that we got when we were calculating chi-square, and if you get a value that's way higher than your critical value in your chi-square, normally that is okay. Generally that is what happens. And so is our hypothesis supported by the chi-square test? With the three categories for the flies to select from, two degrees of freedom are used. When the, using a p-value of 0 0.05, the calculated chi-square value of 48.9 rejects the null hypothesis as it is greater than the maximum value in the table of 5.99. All right, you can pause this and take a look at some of the other parts of the question, but we're going to move forward with our review. 
Some other things you might need to calculate are rate. Rate is simple. This is how quickly a change occurred. If you're analyzing a line graph, this would be rise over run. So the change in the dependent variable divided by the change in the independent variable. Percent change might be something else you would see. Let's talk water potential real quick. Now you might be asked to calculate water potential or the solute potential in a particular problem. This is simple algebra. So what you're going to do is know that the ionization constant is always one, which they tell you in the formula sheet. Your molar concentration is probably going to be given to you in the problem. You might need to read it from a graph or deduce it from the problem. Your R value is always going to be constant and this will always be on your formula sheet. And your temperature you're going to need to use in Kelvin. So you take whatever it is in degrees Celsius and you add 273 and that should give you your temperature in Kelvin. And all you do is multiply all these values together. Remember to multiply it by negative one as well. So negative I, which is one, our molar concentration, our R constant, and then our temperature. Now generally our solute potential is going to be the same as our overall water potential because if it's an open container our pressure potential is going to be zero. Now it says this on the formula sheet as well you might want to do a few practice problems to refresh if you need to. Hardy-Weinberg is another calculation you might see. Remember our conditions for Hardy-Weinberg is that it's a large population. There is no mutation, there is no migration, no natural selection, and random mating. Remember this is a model. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium does not exist in real life, but we use it to see if evolution is occurring. P squared is going to be the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals in the population, 2PQ, the frequency of heterozygous individuals, and Q squared, the frequency of homozygous recessive individuals. P is the frequency of the dominant allele totally, so all of the big A's. Q is the frequency of the recessive allele, all of the little A's in our population, and you can use both or either one of these two equations. They're both part of Hardy-Weinberg to calculate. All right, I'm going to go through a few content and themes that come up really frequently. Again, I'm going through this information really fast to make sure that you guys have enough time to commit to your own studying, but please follow along and make sure you go back and watch other videos if you feel like that's necessary. All right, if you're taking the exam in 2020, remember the unit on evolution has been removed because of the COVID-19 crisis, but there are some evolutionary themes that show up before unit seven. So you might need to remember to study endosymbiosis. Remember, this is the idea that eukaryotic organisms arrived due to engulfing smaller prokaryotic organisms and forming a symbiotic relationship. There's evidence for this in that we have organelles with double membranes, the mitochondria have their own DNA, and our energetic processes. Remember glycolysis, which is a conserved process, could have happened when there was no oxygen on Earth because it is an anaerobic process, and it is one of our most universal processes of respiration. Remember, nearly all existing organisms perform glycolysis. Glycolysis occurs under anaerobic conditions, and glycolysis occurs in the cytosol, so you don't need any organelles to do it. Why do, organisms, why do organisms have organelles anyway? They're good for compartmentalization, so that's increased efficiency, it provides a favorable, favorable local environment for metabolic reactions, and it protects the cell from potentially damaging metabolic reactions. In our energetics, when we're talking about the metabolic pathway where glucose is degraded to carbon dioxide and water, that is glycolysis. This pathway, again, takes place in the cytosol. You might want to go back and review your steps in cellular respiration. And the important part at the very end is our proton gradient in the mitochondria. It's going to be generated by the electron transport chain and used for ATP synthesis. This is the energy that we're getting at the end of the process. Photosynthesis is the process that converts solar energy into chemical energy. Light energy is converted from photons into the energy that we need, and carbon is fixed into organic compounds that the cell can later use in cellular respiration. You might want to review the steps, and of course here's the equation for photosynthesis. If you are good at drawing, I am not, but this is an example of my sketch here. It might be good to sketch out the steps of things like cellular respiration photosynthesis. I found that that is a really good study tool for me. If we're talking about signal transduction pathways, remember these are characterized by a signal, a transduction, and a response. A signal could be something generated in a unicellular organism, or it could be something as part of a multicellular signaling pathway. Cell signaling pathways are highly specific and regulated, and one signal molecule can cause a cascade effect, releasing thousands of molecules in a cell. And these pathways evolved from a common ancestor as well, millions of years ago. The result or the response of a signal transduction pathway could be something like gene expression, production of a hormone, suppression of a genetic activity, or even apoptosis. 
You might want to review DNA, central dogma, or DNA structure. Remember the different parts of the DNA molecule. The backbone includes a phosphate group, a ribose sugar, and the nucleotide base is attached here. It could be A, T, G, or C if it's DNA. You could include a U if it's RNA. And you probably want to remember DNA is negatively charged. This will be helpful for biotechnology and some other components of our cellular processes. All right, if we're looking at our cell cycle and checkpoints, a number of internal controls or checkpoints regulate pro progression through the cell cycle and interactions between cyclins and cyclin dependent kinases control the cell cycle. If something is wrong, if an error is detected, apoptosis generally occurs, which is programmed cell death, but errors in this particular cycle could also lead to disease like cancer where we have uncontrolled cell division, unregulated cell division. For reproduction, make sure you review the different types of reproduction. If we're talking about mitosis, this is producing two genetically identical daughter cells. Meiosis produces cells with half of the normal amount of genetic material, and meiosis is the process that produces haploid or our sex cells or gametes. We have lots of reasons we have genetically diverse populations for those organisms that undergo meiosis, some of which are the independent assortment that occurs, random fertilization that happens, and then of course crossing over, which can lead to a functionally infinite combination of genetic information. Now, you might want to review your cell transport situations, hypotonic environments, hypertonic environments, how those can occur in nature. And if you're talking about genes, a crossover frequency of less than 50% means our genes are probably linked. One last thing to brush up on are pedigrees. Those could be a common question that could show up. Be able to look at a pedigree and predict an inheritance pattern in genetics as well. Now that is not everything that's gonna show up on the AP Biology exam, but hopefully it was a last minute helpful crash review for you. So please make sure you check out some of my other resources. I will link some of my favorites in the description below. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe and comment. Thank you guys for watching and good luck on the exam.